and freak knuckles and we're at pumpkin hill you ready i ain't gonna let it get to me i'm just gonna creep down in pumpkin hill i got some hello and welcome to the zelda informer podcast um as officially of this past weekend and now i am your host alfred tabax um i'm joined by two wonderful and beautiful men uh nathaniel rumpeljance say hi yo 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 and a returning star, McIntyre. Hey, what's Stop. going on? <laughs> and, you know, we could be out there trick-or-treating and, and getting candy, but I think the real treat is being among friends recording a podcast tonight. I did trick-or-treat. Okay, so... It's all over in my area. So, so Nate abandoned us, but <laughs> it's okay. So, let's just get right into the news. Um, I have, like, as Nate usually does, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to start with some Zelda news. And we have uh, not a, a huge thing, but it's still a pretty big thing for those of you that uh, still have the game. So, Ravio and you guys, we knew before, have been were confirmed for Hyrule Warriors Legends, but now we saw gameplay of them in the game, which looked pretty good. We saw how they play, we saw how they uh, interacted. And I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. Like, do you think that they are a good addition to the game? Were they necessary? Would you rather have seen other characters in the game? Uh, it actually released today. It did? Yes. Okay. As of today, as of the recording of the... By the way, we are recording on Halloween. That's true. That's so, why trick-or-treating. Like, we, we release on Wednesday, so just people know, like, if there's Halloween <laughs> stuff, it's because this is Halloween Especially the intro music. <laughs> just be careful. Yes. It's very subtle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I actually played a little bit of it, because I, I bought the big DLC pass way back when. Um, it's fun. I, I I like the characters, but again, there hasn't been a character they added that I don't like. So maybe my opinion doesn't matter because I I'm kind of biased towards liking them. Mm-hmm. Um, a little. Uh, since this, as far as we're aware, this is like the final DLC for the game. I wish there would have been like a little bit of story added on just to end everything. But. Eh. I can't really complain because they did a story edition already earlier. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I like about Nintendo in terms of their DLC is that it's not like, oh, well, the game was incomplete and now we feel like they need to add extra stuff to complete the story. Like, I feel like the the game, kind of like Smash Brothers, not that Smash Brothers had a story to it, but it was kind of a complete game and then anything extra was just extra stuff. That Smash Bros. used to have a story it, way back in the day. Back in the Wii game. Um, and 64 days, too. Really? Yeah, oh. there was a big story around Master Hand. Oh, okay. So what do you think? Yeah, a lot, a lot of people forget that because like that hasn't been what Smash Bros. has been about in a long time. Yeah, I like the Subspace <laughs> Emissary. That was a fun thing. Oh, Subspace Emissary was awesome. People hated it. I loved it. <laughs> what do you think about those characters, McIntyre? In terms of like uh, Hyrule Warriors, I, in all honesty, I haven't been keeping up too much on it. Uh, but what I really enjoy about <laughs> Hyrule Warriors in general and how the characters really like got fine tuned, or at least not really as balanced, because I know Fierce Deity Link is just absolutely broken. But I love it. <laughs> um, in terms of like new, ca- it feels like it should be broken. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> uh, but in terms of like, let's say, uh, new characters I would like to see in um, Hyrule Warriors. Uh, let me think. Uh, I don't, honestly, I would like to see uh, Russell and uh, the Hero Shade in uh, Hyrule Warriors. And I mm. thought they really needed to be there in the first place, but uh, maybe in the future. Yeah, in terms of uh, Twilight Princess characters, well, I really do like the fact that we have Midna and Zant, or Zant, however you want to pronounce it. I- I'm okay with Twilight Midna, but her, her voice is weird. Like, mm-hmm. the-, the grunts or whatever noises she makes, they just they sound weird. It's like they don't match up with the in-game stuff. Yeah. It just sounds like... like go ahead. I don't know. <laughs> no, it, it's like... I, I know that, you know, the in-game stuff apparently was... I, I can't remember. It was something talking backwards thing for it, but it... I don't know. It, I, I wish they were... Whoever did all the stuff for the original Midna, I wish they would have just had them come back for this game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just feels weird that... It, it's one of the few times, like, there, there's some games that switch voice actors for things, and you can't really tell because some of those voices are easier to pull off. Um, like, even the guy who does all the Mario voices, there's several people that could do Mario just as good as he does. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to, like, knock what he does. He is the voice of Mario, so, like, he should be doing it as long as he can. 
But it's like, you know, if a day comes where he can't do it anymore, Nintendo won't have a problem finding someone who sounds like him. Um, just, I, I don't know if it's because of the iconic nature of Mario, so people have just practiced it enough to do it. Uh, but it, I don't know. It, it felt like they kind of cheapened out on that aspect. And, and for, for me, as a huge Twilight Princess fan, it's really jarring. Um, like, you're playing Twilight Princess HD, then you hop in the Hyrule Warriors, and it's like, oh, okay. These are the same characters? Like, really? <laughs> that reminds yeah, me. For all but that's, like, my one complaint out of all this DLC they've released. It's like, going back well, to that just, the thing, the Twilight mean there really wasn't DLC for the 3DS. The, that's true. Charles true. Barnet that's true. said he's no longer the voice of Mario. Like, it said, like, he was the former voice or something like that. Oh, that was a Facebook bug. Oh. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. It said he was the former everything, and it, apparently it happened to a bunch of people. I'm glad because I was worried about that too. I didn't. I didn't yeah, know. I read that story, and there was like so many sites that didn't update it. It's like, dude, he literally tweeted out that no, he's still the voice of Mario. It was a Facebook bug, <clears throat> but apparently no one follows him on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that poor, for all poor of guy. The- I'm sorry for you, Charles. Man, you're an awesome voice actor. You know what's weird about him? Okay, I watched him do a panel. I don't know if it was Comic Con or something, so some one of those cons that so maybe with Pax East. I don't know. He did some panel, and you're hearing him talk. He sounds like he is Mario. Like yeah. that's just who he is. That's like how he talks. That I mean, part of it I was like, man, this is kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> like he literally is Mario. Like that's his personality. He's like adopted the fact that I'm Mario, and that's just the way it is. Well, I've never seen like <laughs> a voice actor love their character so much like he does. Like, his personality yeah. personifies what Mario is. Like I, I met him at this the past Comic Con I was at in June of lo- this past year. Yeah, this year, and he signed my Smash Brothers game. And for all the nice. characters, he like made the voices as he wrote them out, like on Mario or uh, Luigi or Wario. And it was just it was really funny to watch because like this is something that he does every day. I, I imagine that like he's talking to people. And just slips into these voices. <laughs> it's just natural. <laughs> it's just who he is. Yeah, <laughs> he needs to stay that way for as long as he can. It, that's we need people like that. It, as I said, as annoying as it got to me hearing him, his personality basically be Mario for like an hour on a panel. It, it it's still one of those like it's highly unique. Mm-hmm. Um, so as much as I might get annoyed by it, it's just maybe because I don't want to hear. The personality of Mario talking to me for an hour. It's not, not that entertaining to me, but for, you know, it's still really cool that he basically lives and breathes these characters. Um, just really dedicated to his craft, obviously. Mm-hmm. So. so, moving on from that topic then, um, a recent report was put out that said Nintendo will still put out 3DS software post Switch launch. So, after we get the, the Switch. Uh, we will still get 3DS software. The, the believe that the console can still live with the Switch. And, and that kind of makes sense because they've really pushed the fact that while it is a hybrid, it's primarily a home console. So while it can be taken on the go, they for some reason they're emphasizing that it's not the main way to play it and they still want to push out 3DS <laughs> software. So what do you guys think about that? Man. <laughs> Um, uh, there, there's a couple paths I think you can take with this. There's the viewpoint that they said this exact same thing about the DS, <laughs> and the DS ended up overtaking everything. It's basically like a fail safe, like, oh, if the Switch fails, it's okay. We never abandoned the 3DS, so we can release the 4DS or whatever. Um, you know, just, I mean, that was the plan with the DS. If the DS was a failed idea, they would just go back to the Game Boy brand and release a new Game Boy. Um, but they didn't need to do that, obviously, because the DS blew up. So that's one way to take it. But that's, I, I think that it all depends on what exactly the Switch is. Now, obviously, we know it's a hybrid. It's a home console. They're emphasizing it's a home console first that you could take with you because they're, they're trying to make it be, look, you could take AAA gaming on the go. That's never been a thing that's worked this well before, and we're trying to make it a thing. And that only works if the system is powerful. That only works if somehow they can maintain at least three hours of battery life. That's the rumor. I hope it's more than that. But, again, if it's really, really powerful, you, I mean, that's a lot. Three hours of battery life is pretty good, um, especially for AAA home console gaming. Mm-hmm. So I think it depends on what they're doing with the Switch. Because if they come up with the Switch and say, look, this thing is $250, 
and it's you know twice or three times as powerful as a Wii U, not quite at Xbox One level, and we're gonna run the 3DS along with it. 3DS is two hundred dollars. It, it it feels like they're gonna be competing in like the same market for that handle and stuff. Where people making games for the 3DS might be like, well, why aren't we making them just for the Switch? Why are we still making them for the 3DS? <laughs> I think the only way it ex- it can like coexist is it comes out the 3DS, the new 3DS, whatever, drops down to one hundred fifty bucks, and then the uh, Switch sells at 300 and then they're just targeting two different markets where you're going to buy your kids a 3DS or 2DS and the adults are going to buy the Switch. And then you could argue you could support both platforms. Yeah, but... But then... But then... The, the, in the back of my mind, that's like, but then that defeats part of my hype for the Switch, which was, like, all Nintendo games, one platform. Yeah. That, that's what And that's something I worry about. Yeah, that worried yeah. me about that, too, is, like... Okay, so does that mean... Because for me, when I heard that the Pokemon Company was making a game for the Switch, like, I was like, awesome, maybe we'll get, like, a full... Finally a 3D... Yeah, like a a 3D full Pokemon game. Like, even if it's, like, an advanced port of Sun and Moon, that'd be awesome. But Mm -hmm. to hear that they're still planning on putting stuff out for 3DS, that, for me... Sun and Moon 2 for 3DS next year. Yeah, like, that's what I'm expecting, is, like, we're, we're gonna get, like, some sort of battle revolution for the Switch... And then we're going to end up getting, um, you know, all the mainline Pokemon games still on portables. Which isn't, like like you said, I, I'm excited about the idea of having all of my Nintendo games on one platform. Because that way, you know, if I do want to play X and I don't have to buy Y to play it, I can always just play it on one console. Um, it also helps the software droughts. Yeah. Because- which is something they need to address. I know they have a huge list of third parties supporting it, but it's kind of like until the proof is in the pudding you need Nintendo to have, like, everything they can have put on the Switch. Yeah, and, and that... Because dividing up your your um, software lineup and dividing up your company or your uh, production studios into two different sections where one's designing for the 3DS and the other's designing for the Wii U, the Wii, or the the, um, the Switch, that that's going to, like you said, it's going to create production droughts or game droughts where we're going to see, you know, one huge block of games come out for the 3DS within, like, a span of one or two or three months... But then it's just going to stop for a while while we see games come out for the Switch. And while that may not be the worst thing, that's not ideal. Because then we're not seeing you know enough Switch games to come out to warrant buying a Switch. Um, and then we're not seeing enough 3DS games to warrant having it still around. Um, and that's what my fear is. Is like, okay, well you need to sell me on this thing and sell me that it is this all-inclusive Nintendo platform that all of my games are going to be on. And I don't have to worry about you know the 3DS and, and keeping and maintaining that. Well, I'll still have it. I, I'm probably not going to want to go out and buy, you know, if if for whatever reason they decide, well, there's the, the Switch version and then there's the 3DS version that you could pay for, <laughs> which I hope they don't do. Um, I, you know, I'd stick with the Switch version. Like, that that's that would be the quote-unquote definitive version of the game. Yeah, I, I think it's more the, the latter that I originally mentioned where Nintendo is just kind of keeping the 3DS alive because it's their most popular platform. In case the Switch just bombs. That's really interesting. That makes sense. Um, since I believe very recently uh, they announced uh, Mario Maker on the 3DS. And I'm kind of wondering, like, mm-hmm. let's say if the Switch is everything Nintendo wants it to be. Uh, that it does instantly, like, really good sells and all that jazz. Uh, when will be the cutoff date for uh, the 3DS and its lineup? I know Sun and Moon is going to make uh, huge rattles. I'm not sure if it's going to sell more than X and Y. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um but, like, uh, that's a good point that you made. Like, let's say Nintendo starts a 3DS in reserve. However, 3DS sales in Japan have kind of went down as of uh, recently. So I'm not sure if that's yeah. uh, either strategy it would be beneficial. I think the Switch will be actually be pretty popular well, I, in Japan, actually. Yeah, I, I think it's a branding thing. The, the, the 3DS, when the Switch comes out, the 3DS isn't going to be selling like gangbusters. It's already seen sales decline. But, but I think the idea of continuing to support it is the people who already own it are going to feel like they're still getting new games. And so when they're like, okay, well, the Switch is bombing out. We need to release the new DS system. That crowd is still going to be there because you've still been giving them software. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of the opposite of what they did with the Wii and the Wii U, where they did not continue to give the Wii software. So the audience just left and abandoned. And by the time Wii U came around, no one cared anymore. Mm-hmm. Well, and the Wii was already dying down because, you know, it had its strong years 
with with the, the first three yeah, years, the first three probably years the best the three years of any console. And then ever. and then it dropped off because <clears throat> people wanted to go back to more traditional gaming, and that's why you saw things like, you know, say what you will about the the PSI or the the, the PlayStation Motion or whatever it's called now, and and the Connect, but those didn't sell nearly as well as the Wii did in terms of motion controls, because by the time the Wii was tapering off and they released those, like sure it was great, but Nobody really wanted motion controls anymore, and it's coming. It's kind of coming back now with VR, but people like yeah, it's, it's one of those that uh, you know I, I liked what Microsoft did with Connect because it felt like a, an evolution of motion controls. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, it's also the one one idea that ended up not sticking around, <laughs> um, or it kind of did because now VR is like a combination of that plus motion controllers, um, at least on console for the PlayStation. Uh, it, you need the camera and yeah, you, you need, need the, you need the, the PSI. controllers. Yeah. So like it's kind of a combination of both both concepts, but it I don't know. It, I feel like when the Wii tapered off, uh, and I know you know we're, we're kind of off topic, but when, when the Wii tapered off, it was one of those. If you think of all the, just think back of what are all the the best Wii games you could think of. Well, most of them came out in the first three years. It's like Nintendo themselves weren't even releasing the big hits anymore. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's one thing that third parties tapered off, but really it started because Nintendo stopped releasing big games that were just blowing up. Um, they kind of got complacent and then didn't do anything for a few years and then released the Wii U, which everyone thought, oh, well, because they didn't do anything for a few years, they must have all these games ready for Wii U. Didn't happen. And also the same thing we're thinking with Switch. Oh, they haven't done anything with the Wii U for like a year or two. They should have all these games coming out for it. And... I got kind of excited when I thought it was a hybrid that's supposed to be for handheld and home console because, sure, then it's going to by default. You know, it's going to get the next Pokemon game. It's going to get the next Metroid. It's going to get the next anything Nintendo makes. I mean, even Super Mario Run could come to it as long as it has a touch screen. Yeah. Well, I mean, all you need is, like, one button for Super Mario. Yeah, oh, yeah. You, you could, yeah. I mean, it's just tapping the screen, so. But, yeah, it, it's... It's one of those things that when I look at, you know, what they're doing with the Switch and the 3DS, it's just they're, they're, they're trying to play it safe. And I don't know if that can work, but they're trying. I mean, they might. What I can imagine them doing is if they if they want to see how the Switch does, like how it sells. And like we said, it's kind of like it's kind of a weird debut month for it because it's in March, although it's its own like special little area where it can. Um, thrive on its own <laughs> that's not really the holiday rush and i think that that's where they're gonna see um probably their biggest sales because if they come out with well, a big game during the holiday then that's when did, we're gonna see that didn't the 3ds release in march it did and it didn't do that well when it well it did well I, when I thought, it sold yeah yeah i thought that launch month had actually sold really well it did it just died it died because there were no games for it no oh, there was no they games. Were, no, unless you liked street fighter yeah the the five or six that games that it. came out um, for the pilot videos. wings, <laughs> Star Wars, the Clone Wars, Lego. Oh, it had Madden, a really crappy version of it, but it had it. But like, I could see them wanting to see how the Switch does before they even start worrying about the 3DS, but still having it like on the back burner, like just in case something goes wrong, they can just pull it off and be like, "Hey, remember the 3DS? Here's some games coming out for it right now." Um, <laughs> like just like, "Oh crap, we gotta we gotta do something now." Um, I, well, Switch is bombing out. Hey, we have a new Fire Emblem coming this holiday. <laughs> yeah, for the phone. Uh, I don't. Oh, I don't God. see the Switch bombing because it's being. You know, projections are 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 good it, for it. It can't bomb. It can't be worse than the Wii U. Yeah, no. I it, just it has to be because the messaging already is so much better. Well, because it has a message for it. The Wii U didn't have one. The Wii, the Wii U had one at the start, and then it tried changing the message like three times before release. Well, it was like, when it came right out the doors at E3, the first time we saw it, we didn't know if it was a controller or a game system, and they never really confirmed that till after E3. So, it was like... Well, like, the, the first time they really hit hard on the Wii U, they said, look, this is a Wii, but it's for you. This is for hardcore gamers. We have unprecedented partnerships with third-party companies like EA. Like, this is... We're going to have all the third-party software plus all the... Like, it was what everybody wanted that was a hardcore gamer, and it it never really happened. And then you find out the specs. Then you find out the third parties are bailing on it. And then they end their E3 right before launch with Nintendo Land, totally altering their entire messaging for the product. It's like like Nintendo knew they screwed up, 
And now they're like, oh, well, we're going to fall back on the Blue Ocean Wii crowd. And that didn't work because that Blue Ocean crowd hasn't been paying attention to this thing the entire time. Um, plus, the name is terrible yep. to try to make any sense to that crowd. <coughs> but Well, talking about specs then, um, recently a rumor came out that uh, for all of the Nintendo dev kit specs that they were leaked. Oh, yeah. Um, now, keep in mind that these are... Some, some reports are saying that these match the retail units... Um, like Emily Rogers is saying that these are confirmed for both the dev units and the retail units, but sometimes the dev just the RAM. Yeah, that's all she. Can sometimes do. the dev units are either less powerful or they're running a different like. There, there's always there's some differences with them, so I'd always be careful to assume that just because the dev units have something that sure. the retail units have something. But I'm gonna kind of read. I'm gonna read some of these off. They might make sense to some of you. They might make <laughs> sense to none of you. But here we go. So the dev units based on the leakers, um, keep in mind this is still a rumor, there's a 4 ARM Cortex-A57 cores with a max of 200 gigahertz. Um, the NVIDIA second generation Maxwell architecture, which we've heard that N- N- NVIDIA is working really close with Nintendo on this. Um, 256 CUDA cores, max 1 gigahertz, um, 1024 flops per cycle. Um, eight four gigabytes of RAM, which is better than the Wii U, which only had two gigabytes of RAM, and that's being confirmed over and over and over again that that's what it's going to have. Um, Thirty-two gigabytes of uh, storage, so kind of the same as the Wii U. Um, but keep in mind that since these games are going to be on carts, they're not going to need to be on the system, and they're going to save natively to the carts. Hopefully, um, then they're going to have USB 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, it'll be 10 or sorry, 1280 by 720. Um, for the LCD, then 1080p at 600 or 60, not 600 FPS or 4K at 30 FPS max. Um, and then of course, another rumor is that the pad itself will have multi-touch, 10 point multi-touch. So that sounds good. If, if you know what it means, <laughs> cause some of that, I'm like, yeah, I understand what this means. Some of it's like, I have no idea. Um, and Nate probably knows way more about that than I do. He built his own computer. Um, I know about cores and stuff and, and RAM. <laughs> well, I, I built the computer, so now I'm an expert. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the thing is, is on paper, those specs are actually really underwhelming. Um, they are a, – a, a lot of the stuff you hear there, you know, like the, the ARM stuff and the CUDA cores, everything there lines up with a Tegra X1 – which was what Eurogamer said was in the dev kits mm-hmm. at the time. Um, so, like, it actually com- almost – it doesn't confirm anything because it's a rumor, but kind of adds some weight to what Eurogamer was saying originally. And the Tegra X1 is, isn't that much more capable than what the Wii U is currently. So it's actually not that impressive. However, it is it has been noted by Eurogamer and by – more importantly, by um, – I always say it wrong. It's not NVIDIA. Everyone got mad at me for calling it that. N- on the NVIDIA? Podcast. NVIDIA, yeah. Anyways, uh, yeah. if you've been watching the Zelda Forward podcast this long, you know I suck at pronouncing If, if you get mad at him mispronouncing NVIDIA, but not about him <laughs> mispronouncing every other word, then you need to stop nitpicking, okay? It's a right. losing battle. Uh, yeah, so... A, Eurogamer suggested that because there's active air cooling, which we can't confirm that's a thing, but if you look at that video, the Switch video again, you can see air vents on the top, which has never really been on a Nintendo handheld, which tells you there's probably active air cooling in there. Uh, The Tegra X1 doesn't really need active air cooling. Now, it can have it. Uh, There is a box that they have, a gaming box or something, they, they release for TVs. Um, that does have active air cooling on the Tegra X1, which eliminates bottlenecks. So it is possible that that air cooling is for the Tegra X1. Mm. However, NVIDIA came out and said that it is a custom chip based on their Tegra technology using the latest GPU stuff, tech, whatever. Uh, And the latest GPU tech uses Pascal, which means it would be in a totally different ballpark than the Maxwell-based Tegra X1. Um, so it, it's kind of one of those where NVIDIA has kind of told us it's not going to be a Tegra X1, but that might be what's in the dev units because they aren't done with the custom chip yet. Uh, and that 
developers making games for it now probably won't get a more finalized dev kit until sometime next year. Well, again, keep in mind that these are still just rumors. Like, yeah, again, like they, they are just rumors. Like these are rumors so, of a dev kit that we don't know anything about yet. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people have been like, "All oh, the four gigs of RAM are so are, are so terrible because the other systems have eight. It's not that bad. Games don't need a lot of RAM, guys. They they really do not. RAM is more for the operating system mm-hmm. and the multitasking. It is less for gaming. Like uh, Linus Tech Tips recently did a video on Battlefield One where they were doing, they were pushing, you know, Ultra 4K. That they had a uh, the new the new Titan XP in there with like a 6950K. Like they had all top of the line stuff, and then they started taking away RAM because the game suggests eight gigabytes of RAM. Well, they knocked it down to four gigabytes of RAM, and there was zero performance difference in Battlefield One on ultra settings, which is <laughs> higher than what consoles can do. <clears throat> So it's one of those where RAM didn't have any effect on the performance. Unless it was 2 gigabytes, um, then it would probably have had. Yeah, maybe. But see, again, if it has that effect, it's probably because of the other things the RAM's being used yeah. for. Um, so that's kind of the thing. You need enough RAM to handle that multitasking so it doesn't affect the game. But you don't really need a lot of RAM for games. What affects games more are the storage read. So so what's being read? Um, you know, when, when games used to read directly off disks and not install... Um, that actually slowed transfer speed down. That's why we had so many load screens on the 360 and PlayStation 3. Like, so many load screens. Because we had to wait for all that data to transfer. Um, with carts, we're not, that's not a worry anymore. It's, it's not quite as fast as using an SSD, but it's really dang close. Um, so, the carts are going to fix that. Uh, the, if you have stuff installed on the internal hard drive, you already don't have to worry about that. And then, the... Uh, GPU and CPU or a, com- a, com- a combo chip, that's what's really going to be where you need to worry about bottlenecks. And we don't really know, you know, this 4 gigabytes of RAM is, is being called just RAM. It's not being called VRAM. VRAM is totally different. If this was 4 gigabytes of VRAM, that's actually a lot of VRAM. Mm-hmm. Um, like, consoles don't have that kind of VRAM. <laughs> that, I mean, that's half of the VRAM I have in my 1070 right now, and that can run 4K at 120 FPS. Like, you don't... That's not happening. <laughs> There's not four gigs of VRAM. But uh, it, it's one of those where the base specs aren't really that nice. They're just okay. Um, probably not good enough to get third-party ports, which is why some people are really upset about these leak specs because it doesn't look even close to on par with what we have out there today. However, again, this is all rumored. And things that aren't a rumor are is what NVIDIA said themselves, that it's based on their latest architecture, and it's a totally customized chip. So these leaked specs are not going to match up with whatever the final specs are. Well, and we already know that because these leaked specs are matching up with something that already exists. And keep in so, mind that it is still we a don't dev know. unit. <laughs> like. As a dev unit, yeah. you're not going to have the, the hottest, latest technology yeah. for, the, for the console. Well, what, what I take for performance, there was a rumor a while ago. Uh, it came from the guy from the Wall Street Journal, uh, whatever. I can't remember his name. Um, and it, it's, it's something that guy that's been doing these leaks the whole time. He he, I think he actually works for the Wall Street Journal in Japan. Um Anyways, so he put up a thing where he said that there that his sources – like his dev sources have said that they are moving a bunch of PlayStation 4 games over to the Switch after the reveal of the Switch. Um, and that's like, okay, that that's what you need to know if you want to know if this thing's powerful enough. If people are like, we're going to take our PlayStation 4 games and put it on the Switch, <clears throat> then the Switch must be powerful enough to do that. Yeah. Um, and that's to me where I'm like, okay, well, you know, we could speculate about all these specs and what they mean all they want. What really matters is... How do the games run, and how nerfed do they really have to be? And I guess one benefit for Nintendo, and this is something I never thought they would do, so it was something I was always worried about with their hardware because they've never allowed it. NVIDIA, in that press release, mentions that they are making the dev tools. So they are literally handling pretty much 90% of the hardware work. They are providing the internals that run the whole thing, and they are creating the tools that people make games on it with. That's huge. Because those are they're the company that makes a lot of the tools for the PC cards, and that you know a lot of these third party companies are already very comfortable using these tools. So it, that's 
um, that's really going to streamline. And, and that might be why so many third parties are interested because that really streamlines bringing games to the platform because you have to remember, for all the all the complaining, um, you can run games at under console specs on underpowered PCs just fine at 60 FPS. Like, that's a thing. There are gamers that do not have really nice computers that run games that look worse than on console, but it could still run. Mm-hmm. Um and that's because of the dev tools like third parties are already used to having things scale like this so uh if nvidia is making awesome scalable tools it it doesn't matter then that this is underpowered because it could be just like a mini pc and you're just able to bring it to it and scale it down that's a weird phrase to call a nintendo console as a mini pc <laughs> a, a mini pc <laughs> it's almost more like i know uh the xbox one and playstation 4 have been you know often compared to moving closer and closer to pc it's got the x86 architecture i think what nintendo's doing is almost closer to pc uh just not in form factor mm-hmm. like its capabilities are not pc but uh what uh, what the company behind it is very much a pc company and i, I think that's why these third-party companies are actually attracted to it because oh man nintendo we don't have to use crappy nintendo things and go through 50 different channels and translations and emails to try to get support we could just talk to nvidia or nvidia and get direct support like that speaks english that's awesome <laughs> so I, I i i don't know that's all i really have to say on, on the specs i don't know if this means they're good or bad i i'm still excited <laughs> adding on to that uh sure from previous statements from both Kimishima and uh, also Reggie Philzeme, uh, they based on their language, they didn't really say they wanted to really compete with the likes of Microsoft and Sony in terms of uh, like graphical horsepower and all that jazz. Uh, if these rumors are true and these are actual specs, they're pretty great. But in all honesty, uh, horsepower or power in general and the graphical fidelity of, of games doesn't really seem to be the main focus of the Switch. It appears to be more of uh, um, getting both of uh, the console uh, teams under Nintendo Nintendo's draw and also the mobile uh, aspect of Nintendo's company to be all be uh, swashed together under the banner of one console, which is the Switch. Um, so in short, I think games and you can play the games um, on the go is the main focus. I'm not sure if graphical stuff <clears throat> would be in that case. Yeah. Well, Nintendo hasn't cared about graphics since the GameCube days. But it's um, never really been a problem. Like, you never looked at, like, Super Mario Galaxy, and you're like, man, this game looks no. horrible. It's like, this game looks no. great with what they have. Nothing's a problem for Nintendo. Uh, Nintendo games are going to sell to Nintendo fans. It's just the way it is. Breath of the Wild looks absolutely fantastic on the Wii U. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Nintendo has always been very good at maximizing whatever hardware they have. The the I think what... I think what's going to happen, and this is why fans are worried a little bit when they see these specs, it's not so much that power matters and that this needs to be a PlayStation 4 Pro in your pocket. Like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but um, I think fans are worried that if this trends like Nintendo's recent home consoles, because they keep advertising it as one, that means it has no third-party support, which means it's stuck being just a Nintendo machine. And Nintendo... It may be okay with that, but I don't know. Like, if they're planning to sell like 10 million in the first year, like, you can't just be a Nintendo only machine. Because that's what the Wii U was. And even if it has more games than the Wii U, I don't think Nintendo games alone are going to make it successful. It's not. Like, the 3DS, the 3DS has actually a lot of really good third party support out of Japan. Um, so it's not just a Nintendo machine. Like, some of the most popular games on the 3DS come from Japan and are not made by Nintendo. Oh, yeah. Like, Yokai Watch. Yeah. Monster Hunter. Anything by level 5. Just... Yeah, anything by level 5. So I, I guess it's not so much that I think Nintendo cares about power. I think they have to recognize that third parties care. Like, Bethesda literally came out and said, if it is powerful enough, we will put, like, games on it. Mm-hmm. So and Bethesda is on the list. So, you know, it is what it is. Maybe that means something. They pledge support. That's what we yeah. know from that list. If it's just Skyrim Remastered, well then, I mean, that's great. But if it's nothing else after that, well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so kind of moving on to another rumor real quick uh, before we move into other stuff. Um, <gasps> the Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is a rumor that's been going around. Um, there's, there, I kind of combine these two into one. So the game carts themselves have been rumored to be 16 gigabytes, um, like in terms of their storage and space and whatnot. Um, but then the Nintendo Switch will also support 
SD cards or SDX cards or micro SDX cards up to 128 gigabytes, but will not support external hard drives. Um, so take that how you will. I feel like if you have like a 128 gigabyte um, SD card, that's that's fine. Like I don't see us. I don't see downloading these games being that big of a draw, especially since the cards are probably going to run faster. Um, that's just me. Mm-hmm. I mean, downloading native natively will run faster inevitably, but I don't know. I, I don't see downloading games onto the console being that big of a problem. My only hang up with that is, is that there are some people that just strictly download games. Like uh, my two of the guys that I live with have like two terabyte external hard drives for their Xbox Ones, and they download a crap ton of games onto their Xbox Ones. So they need that, and they're almost out of space on those things. And so if you are one of those people that just loves to download games onto the console instead of having the um, uh, the physical copy, then that's kind of a problem for you because I'm not going to try to do the math in my head. I should have done this beforehand. But you can only fit so many 16 gigabyte games, if that's true, onto a 128 gigabyte SD card. McIntyre, you got any thoughts? Oh. Well, that's okay. Going back to the whole like cartridge thing, um, I heard rumors too that the cartridge is going to be thirty-two gigabytes, and now okay. recently there were sixteen gigabytes. Um, I'm not necessarily sure if either two is valid. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because um, I believe the next uh, Nintendo Direct, in which uh, Nintendo is going to show off more about the Switch, is that next year? Or is it this year? Like it's January next year. Next year, yeah, January twelfth. January twelfth. I'm assuming. A- and it's not even a direct. It's actually like a live event. Oh, wow. Surprisingly, yeah, surprisingly, like that's they announced it like it's a E three event. Yeah, I'm assuming um, Nintendo will show off stuff there. Um, what are the sources for these rumors, by chance? Like, what was it again? Um, I've got oh, one second. Um, one's from VG or Video Game Two Forty Seven. Um, I had a bunch of them still up, but I closed my browser. Let me look that up real quick. Uh, but anyways, uh, I suppose it's possible that 16 gigabyte or 32 gigabyte both sound plausible in all honesty. Um, in terms of like, let's say, uh, like uh, gaming memory and all that jazz, I haven't really looked too much into the intricacies of that. Uh, so if somebody else with much more knowledge than that I could probably shed more light. Um, but at this moment, I would say to, like, of course, report on rumors, and, but just know that they are rumors that may or may not yeah. be false. Um, but, yeah, I do think that we will learn more solid information and more uh, intricate uh, manifestations of the Switch uh, and that January live event. Um, and also probably see uh, more games about it. Since I'm actually excited for the the new Mario Switch game, it actually looks really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so the uh, the carts they don't really matter. People are putting a lot of focus on how big the carts are. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter to anybody but game developers. And I know a lot of fans are like, oh, but sixteen gigabytes isn't enough for like Battlefield One, which is sixty gigabytes. The rumors are all talking about the standard size. Yeah. There is a standard size for every format. The 3DS has a standard size cart, but several games use bigger carts than what the standard size is, including games from Nintendo. So it really is completely irrelevant at a consumer level. They're going to be able to get as big a carts as they want. The carts that they're using from the rumored type of memory that they're putting in it um can get way the heck bigger than blu-ray discs can hold if a game needs it uh so it's going to be based on a game-to-game basis it's just at a mass production level sure there's probably like a general size that they have like a mass production line for but they will make any size it's not going to be something that's going to hinder a game if a game is bigger than 16 gigs or it's bigger than 32 there will be nintendo cards that you can put them on it's not going to hold anything back well and keep in mind the um, reason why they're doing sd cards on an external drive is because this is primarily portable well not primarily but it, they do want it to be a portable system so yeah dragging like and, and boxes around isn't portable and, and what i i dislike the i mean it's probably true because this is nintendo it's what they do <laughs> Um, I dislike not supporting external hard drives, which 
sucks for people who literally are just going to use this like a home console. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to take it with them anyways. Um, And I dislike that it can only go up to 128 gigabytes. As I just said, Battlefield 1, 60 gigabyte game, two of those you're done. And that's not counting updates and DLC. Because updates and DLC might not be able to go directly on the carts if the carts themselves are already full from the original game. So it, it's kind of, there might be room for save files, but that doesn't mean there's room for anything else. And I, I worry that 120 gigabytes for a console that's being advertised as a home console with AAA games you take on the go, AAA games are going to fill that thing up in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to fill up the 32 gigs in a hurry. We, we already saw it with Wii U. It, oh, excuse me. Basically, if you bought like two Wii U games digitally, like AAA games from Nintendo, that was it. You were full. You had to go back and delete other games in order to install. Yeah. Them. Now, granted, you could re-download them, and you know it'll save your save files. But still, that's adding a pain to the consumer. And I think what's nice about the 3DS is while it has a limit on how big of an SD card you can go, I forget. I forget what the limit is. Um, but the games are so small that you could still have like 50 games installed and take that with you. You're not going to be able to have 50 games installed at 128 gigabytes that are home console games on the go. Like, the convenience of taking that device on the go, part of it is not having to switch out the cartridges all the time. Not having to bring an extra bag that has 30 games in it. And having to dig through those games to find the one you want, when you could just go to your menu and select one that you already have installed. Um, now, th- there are ways they could get around this. They could offer where if you own a cart, you could, like, download that game to the system so you don't have to bring that cart with and then you can just bring with you know you don't have to bring all your carts with that just some of them <clears> that you're not going to install on it but again i it, it's it, it feels like to me we're in an era where yes the 500 gigabytes that released with the playstation 4 and xbox one were not enough because they required you to install games mm-hmm. if you didn't weren't required it would have been fine at launch uh but now we're at the point where people are filling up one terabyte two terabyte and you're going to say, all I can have is 128. And that's me spending extra money to even get that 128 mm-hmm. on my own. And those are expensive. Uh, are they like, if they if they just allowed external hard drives, I don't care. External hard drives are cheap, man. I can go get a 4 terabyte one for, like, 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one, one thing I liked about the Wii U is that it supported external hard drives right away. So, like, I didn't care that, oh, man, the max I can get is a 32. Like, it doesn't matter because I'm going to instantly plug in one of the five external hard drives I have laying around, and I'm good. Um, so I, I do worry that if this is true, and it sounds very true based on what they've done with the 3DS, I, I'm i worried. that That's just not a, for a, a thing that's aimed at home console games. That's not enough. I, I, if they could just lift the limit on SD cards and just like, I, I know they have to install a limit because I think there's a point with SD cards where the transfer speed drops. Um, I forget, I, I don't know enough about SD cards, but I know there's a, a certain size where they can't keep up the same transfer speeds. Um, but I have to believe you can go beyond 128. I mean, there's like one terabyte SD cards out there yeah. now. So there has to be a way to get at least like five. If I, if I can get 500 gigs, I'd be okay with that. And again, one of the things to consider is that Nintendo is trying to split a home console and, or like expl- split the experience between sure. a home console and a portable console, so there are going to be sacrifices there. This isn't going to be like as powerful as the PS4. And we've talked about that before. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It, it's just uh, it's support for like I'm fine if they just want to include 32 gigabytes to start, just because they're Nintendo. You know, they can't go to 100 for some reason. It has to be 32 to keep the price down or whatever whatever excuse that you know they give. But it, it, it's one of those. It's fine to limit that at launch or whatever, but offer me as a consumer the ability to spend my own money to put enough memory on the thing to, yeah. to use it the way I want. Um, and I'm not even a big digital person. I'm, I'm really not. I, I get free digital games from Nintendo's programs and stuff. Um, I've gotten a few review copies that are digital, but it, it's just... Uh, it, it's really frustrating me thinking that I'm going to have to buy physical because the system, despite the fact that Nintendo and all their financial things shows how much digital is growing for them, knowing that this console is basically going against digital, raising a finger to it and saying, sorry, you need to buy cartridges. And that's not even including indie games and all the stuff that don't come out at retail. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it is something that I am concerned with 
uh, for the fact that I can't, even if I have the money, I can't get like external storage for it that would work or internal storage that would work. Uh, um, I guess the, beyond 128. The final but again, obviously it's a rumor, so we yeah. we don't know. But and the final thing I have to say about that too is that I feel like we'd have the same problem that we did with the GameCube, where you were taking in and taking out memory cards each time you wanted to play a different game. Um, yeah, a lot, and a lot of people are worried about that with this too, saying, "Oh, so now I'm going to have to carry you know five or six SD cards." Around. Yeah, and those things, and they're mini SD cards. This is the rumor, so they're even dinkier, easy to lose. Yep. So enough gloom and doom about Nintendo's future. <laughs> um, so, and I think I'm I'm excited about the Switch, by the way. Yeah, there's just even if all these rumors are true, like I'm still excited. I'm still going to buy it. It's going to have the best version of Breath of the Wild. That's enough mm-hmm. for me. So. Before we get on to our special topic of the week, let's talk about our favorite things in gaming news, starting with McIntyre. Yes. Noise. Like just gaming news in general. Just anything yeah. that's happened. Like anything you want. Or if you beat a game and you want to share the glory that you receive from that game, go for it. Uh, <laughs> this week, like I've been kind of busy, so I, well, like I guess the only game I've actually been playing would be uh, Civilization V, but that's a whole other ball of game. <laughs> But in terms of like uh, gaming news, I'm actually really, really excited for. Um, uh, it's not really well, kind of maybe a Nintendo audience. It's Final Fantasy 15. Um, I've been really been keeping up with that since what well, it's been development for like nine years or something. Um, mm-hmm. And then they released a new trailer. It looks pretty good. I've been watching the anime series that went along with it. It's really great. Uh, there was uh, another CG uh, movie called King's Blade, which is okay. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Um, and so I believe uh, Final Fantasy XV comes November 15th. I have to look it up again. Um, but I've mm-hmm. been so pumped for that. Uh, that, Breath of the Wild. And uh, also uh, the new Red Dead Redemption. The, no, not the Red Dead game. I forgot what it was called. Uh, they released a new trailer Rockstar did. Um, and it looks just flipping phenomenal. And I'm a sucker for like uh, the Wild West games, stuff like that. Oh, there it is. So like, uh, I'm really pumped for all that. <laughs> what about you, Nate? Well, I just found out about this. I don't know if it hit today. Uh, apparently, a new Tomb Raider game is leaked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And uh, by Idols Montreal, which is no surprise. I think they're the ones that made the last two. Um, and and the big thing with this one is, you know, because it was, it was spotted on Reddit, apparently. What um, is it spotted Kata- on Reddit? Well... Yeah, uh, but Kotaku is actually saying that it's legit. Uh, so uh, the, the games have been leaked this way before, so it's easy to believe because I, I think Assassin's Creed once got leaked this way. Basically, a guy's working on the game or working on the presentation for the game on his laptop on a subway, and someone like kind of peeked in and snapped a shot of it and then put it on Reddit. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, believe it or not, leaks happen this way. Maybe Maybe people should stop working on unannounced games in public in public yeah anywhere um but anyways uh i really liked the tomb raider reboot and I'm, i loved the last game i thought it was even better than the first uh so this really really excites me um i often consider tomb raider to be like indiana jones and i love indiana jones i've always wanted to be a treasure hunter because of indiana jones <laughs> Uh, it's just my childhood. I, I love it. Uh, Zelda gives me a little bit of that, but Tomb Raider literally gives me what I'm looking for uh, in that regard. So I'm excited because the last two games have been phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, Tomb Raider. And, hey, bring it to the Switch. <laughs> <clears throat> so my two favorite things are about gaming movies. Ooh. And the first one hit, we learned that after years and eons of um, the Uncharted film being put in development hell, it's gotten a new director and Sean Levy, the guy who has directed several episodes of the hit Netflix series Stranger Things, which gives me hope uh-huh. because that did fantastic. I still have yet to watch it. Um, but <laughs> he's going to be helming that. And then in a surprising, crazy turn of events, Deadpool lost... Uh, Deadpool 2 lost Tim Miller as the director, but... In the live-action and CG hybrid Sonic film, Tim Miller, <laughs> the guy that's doing that did Deadpool, is going to direct the film. Well, that's a, that's actually good. Dude. It's just the way you described it before you mentioned who was directing it. I was like, this just sounds bad. 
And then you're like, oh well, it has, it has the right director. Yeah, so. I'm just. It is kind of, Maybe it's going to be good. That's kind of like having Quentin Tarantino direct an episode of Barney, though. Like, what are you expecting well, I'm from sure, that? Like, I'm sure when Deadpool was initially pitched to, like, get done, it sounded like a really stupid <laughs> idea on paper. Well, and then it ended up being brilliant. But Deadpool so. was also very crass and, like, graphic. I don't understand, like... I mean, I understand that certain, like, directors shouldn't be pigeonholed, but, like, coming off of Deadpool and then working on Sonic, it's like a bit of a... <laughs> A different like paradigm there. Maybe it, maybe it's gonna be a crass Sonic. <laughs> it's just edgy. It's gonna be Shadow the Hedgehog the film. It's gonna be rated. It's gonna be a rated R man. Shadow the Hedgehog. Let's make it into a movie. They say rated R video game movies can't work. Well, let's try it. Here you go with Sonic. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so gonna give him the gruff the gruff voice of a forty five year old, voiced by Christian Bale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on to the discussion question that I have for this week since it's Halloween I figured we should talk about horror and one let's talk about our favorite horror games that we've ever played and two the worst horror games we've ever played because there are some pretty bad ones out there so oh my god I'll let you guys start and then we'll, we'll go from there I'll see your favorite horror games and then the worst horror games you've ever played like um uh, first, before I start with anything, um, the first video game I ever played was Super Metroid, and uh, at first I, I was like a kid. I was in uh, it was this was in New York. Uh, I was in an apartment, and my cousins were playing it, and uh, they were playing it. It was like storming outside, and like uh, I, I uh, like they were just all huddled around the couch and the TV. I originally thought that Super Metroid was a horror game. Um, just by the ambience, like uh, like Samus is lone, like uh, just killing all these aliens and stuff like that. Uh, I legitimately thought that Super Metroid was a horror game, and like for a good while, I still thought that was it until I played uh, Super Me- uh, Metroid Prime for the GameCube. In terms <laughs> of like a good horror game that like I never actually played, I, I always wanted to try out the Condemned. It was like I think it was a launch title for the original xbox 360 or something like that um mm-hmm. that in uh, uh alien isolation i've actually heard really good things about that one um and in terms of like a really bad horror game uh i'm trying to think uh, i'm not really sure actually um maybe somebody else has some other thoughts but yeah <laughs> what about you nate mm. oh horror games my Let's see. I know I might get some flack for this. I, don't, I mean, I guess it's a horror game. My least favorite is Resident Evil Four because of the controls, or it, just because of the game. I, it just it, it's not okay. It's, I'm not saying it's a bad game. So like I say, it's like my least favorite horror game. I'm not saying it in terms of it being a bad game because I, I actually like <laughs> Resident Evil Four. I just don't like it as a horror game. I like it more as like more of an action game. And I know it's not like Resident Evil Six. That's an action game, uh, but it, it just it didn't scare me, I guess. And when I think horror, I think I'm freaking the hell out. Um, and there's a lot of indie games that have done a really good job of that horror. And, and that's the thing with horror. Like, there's so many different types of horror. You know, you have jump scares. You know, you have grossing you out. Um, you have creepy. the the mind game horror, which I, I love mind game horror, like messing with my brain. Making me think something that's not real, like it's that stuff. Just oh, I love that kind of stuff. So Resident Evil it doesn't really do any of that for me. I mean, it tries to do jump scares. It just d- didn't scare me, I guess. And I played that when I was a kid, and I wasn't scared. So <laughs> I don't know what I was watching to be desensitized back then. But um, I've been more scared by the Walking Dead television show, and that's I shouldn't be more I scared. I call that. that a horror film. Yeah, like it's not horror. So like that's why I'm saying that I don't consider that to be horror. And the fact that scares me more than Resident Evil 4 it means I I just think it's a little overhyped, I guess, as a horror game. Uh, although I admit it is more of a horror game than Resident Evil 6. Uh, so I guess I would say that's my least favorite because I just don't consider it a horror game. But everybody else on the planet tells me it's a horror game. Uh, my favorite is going to be a game I've talked about before. And it's gonna be a game that everyone's gonna disagree with me on and call me an idiot. But it's Zombie U. Oh yeah, they didn't hear that. I apologize to you for that because my audio <laughs> cut out. Yeah, I yeah, like I the did. game now. There, there's your apology. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I'm not saying that it's the greatest horror game to ever exist. I have played some indie games in particular. Indie game, The indie game scene is really starting to get good with horror. Um, I just can't think of any one indie game uh, that I would put above Zombie U right now for what it did for me because it kind of had the psychological and the jump and it kind of combined everything I like about horror into a single experience, um, including creating uh, intense moments where you know you could die, and you could see your death coming, but it's all based on how fast you're able to hack something or how fast you're able to do something. Like, like it's kind of like watching those horror films where uh, you're watching the thing and they're doing something. You know they got to get that door open, or they're you could see this thing coming that's going to kill them. You know it's going to happen. Well, in the movie, if it's the main character and you're only a half hour in, you know they're going to live. They're not dying yet. They might die at the end, but they're not dying right now. So, like, in movies, I have a lack of suspense for those moments because you can kind of predict what's going to happen. It's very rare that a movie surprises me with a character dying too soon or living through something that you don't think they're going to live through because you don't think they're a major character yet. Um, But in games, that's totally different because that kind of suspense can kill you Mm -hmm. or you could survive. You don't know because it's based on what you are good at. Um, and they did a really good job balancing the difficulty of those situations um, to really up my heartbeat and really get me intense. And when I get through it, I'm like, oh my god, I'm so, I need to take a, I need to like take a break for like a second, hit pause. I'm I can't believe that I just made through that. Or like I died, and I'm like, I can't believe I couldn't get that last little part of the lock and I died. Um, and that's just one type of, of 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 aspect in that game that I really like. That's just one that stands out the most because. That is actually a specific use of the gamepad that created that situation, um, which I've never gotten in any other game before. Uh, but it, it really did a good... I, I just like the... I know some people aren't into the story. I like the story. I don't know what it is about zombie apocalypse <laughs> stories. I just like them, um, which is why I like The Walking Dead. I, I don't even watch the new episodes of it anymore. Um, I'll probably... Once it hits, the new the, this current season hits on Netflix, I'm sure I'll watch it, but... Because I, I like binge watching. I don't like what happens next. What ha- no, I can know. Just binge watch. <laughs> but thanks Netflix for ruining television for me. <laughs> like now when Netflix is like, oh, we're coming up with one where we release an episode a week. I'm like, why? You're Netflix. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's. I know a lot of people don't like Zombie U for a lot of various different reasons. But for me, it's one of the few games I've gotten really, really, really scared in. But as I said, I, there's this. I don't know if it's Don't Starve, or is, are you thinking of the top-down one where you're? It's a survival game. Yeah, yeah that's that one's Starve. real. Yeah, that one. That one's really creepy. Mm-hmm. And then the, uh, I, I, it's not really a horror game, but like uh, that. That what is that? Finding Ethan Carter game or whatever. Um, God, what's that called? I don't know. God, it, it looks absolutely fantastic, but that one really creeped me out too. Um, and that's more of a mystery thriller, but again, like thriller and horror kind of blend a lot for me. So I don't know. That's just my favorite. I have like, and this is weird because I typically don't do like horror films. So mm-hmm. like, it's weird that a lot of the games that I like, not like all of them, but some of like, I have a <laughs> vast list of horror games that I like at the top of that list is until dawn. Um, because it's kind of like what like the the premise of Zombie U like it's it's like a it's not really a telltale game because there's still like movement and it's 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 more fluid and um, it, it tells a, good, a weird freaking story um, but it's one of those things where at any point any decision you make can kill off one of the main characters of the game so like you could be thinking man I'm I'm doing a great job here like at one point. I was I had made it through the playthrough my first playthrough of the game with uh I think I only had like maybe two characters die it was like five five or six I think I either had one or two characters die and I was looking for a place to hide for one of the characters and I was like crap where am I gonna go like something's chasing after me and so I flipped open like this this trap door on the ground and this monster came out ripped off my head and ate it and I was like well <laughs> all right then I guess that character's dead and that was a mistake yeah. Uh, everybody watched me do that too and they were like well that y- you messed up um but that's one of those games like there were the suspense was that 
anyone could die at any time. Like they were crucial to the story, quote unquote, but it could play out differently depending on who was still alive. And you could end the game with everyone still alive or with no one still alive. Um, and I, I think that that's like one, like a very kind of like what you're talking about with zombie U, um, but the, more, more stakes for that one. Cause um, they're contingent on the story. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's that's probably my favorite horror game. Um, some of the other ones that I could name probably be Outlast. Um, Outlast is a really good creepy game. Um, I, like you talked about indie games, I, a game that I shouldn't have found as scary as I did, but it was was Among the Sleep. Um, that was a freaky game because what the the premise of it is is you're a baby and you're seeing things through a baby's eyes in the middle of a thunderstorm, and it's just terrifying. Because, like, everything seems fantastical to you because you have no idea what's going on. And the only thing you can do is crawl on the ground. So, it's kind of like Amnesia, which I might get hate for this. But I don't really like Amnesia. I didn't think it was that scary. Hmm. Um, like, it was it was okay. It was like, oh, yeah, I get it. Like, you, you have to collect all these things for story. And then you can only run away. You can't actually fight anything. But I just, I just didn't like it. Like, it wasn't, wasn't the... It was like, okay, well, I guess I have to get through Amnesia. Um, kind of a game so that's probably my least favorite mm. but you know I have more like favorites than non and then one of the ones that like I think like when uh, McIntyre when you were talking about like Super Metroid do you think that was a horror game I don't know if I'd call it a horror game but I always thought Bioshock was um, and that game Aww, sure. was terrifying to me as a, as a kid but it's it's fantastic it has the same suspense as like a a Metroid game, but even more so. Um, and if you haven't played Bioshock, like, what are you doing with your life? Like, that's <laughs> classic games right there. Um, but that's that's it for me on 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 horror games. Oh, horror and, and Castlevania used to uh, freak me out back in the day. The old world ones. Yeah, the mm-hmm. old ones. Um, and, and maybe it was just the theme, like Dracula, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, as a kid, I associate that with Halloween. I associate that with horror, but I, I don't know. It used to freak me out when I got to the final boss fight. I'm like, Oh my, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to swear right now. Like I was so, I was so freaking out. I was so scared. I, I died so many times and I think I cried every time. I mean, that's, that's how I felt like about the well and the shadow temple and Ocarina of time as a kid, that, like scared sure. me. Like I, I had to put down the game for like weeks because oh, yeah. i could not get also through it. the game i was talking about before is the vanishing of ethan Carter. okay and it's listed as an action adventure game so as i said it's not really a horror game but there's just a lot of psychological elements in there that freak me out what about all the five nights at freddy's games <laughs> those don't freak me out that much. <laughs> yeah you get used are those to even horror scares. games yeah they're they're horror like, games but like they, they yeah. they're predictable horror games. I, I I yeah. See that's that's the thing about jump scares is I can get scared by jump scares, but it can't be predictable. So when it's predictable, it's like oh well, I expected that to happen. Well, even like jump scares, like the first five times you get scared by a jump scare, you're like after about that fifth or sixth time, you're like okay, so there's gonna be another jump scare you could, soon. Yeah, you're you're waiting for it, and it's not really yeah, scaring you, know, you. It's just making you jump because you're not. It's like yeah. popping out and screaming or something. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I today, uh, right before the, we actually recorded this podcast, I was, my uh, girlfriend and her sister, who's uh, staying with us for a little bit, they were upstairs watching, like, these scary movies, so I kept doing things to, get, to jump scare them, like, <laughs> so bad, and the thing is, they would know it's coming, and it would still get them, and then when they expected it, that's when I didn't do it. <laughs> So it's like, it, it, like jump scares to me can't come when they're expected. Like, okay, I just had three jump scares in the last fifteen minutes. I'm I'm waiting for the next one. Well, if the next one doesn't come for forty minutes, I'm not really waiting for it anymore. Mm-hmm. And then it can get me again. And that's kind of what I was doing to them. Like they didn't, they were waiting for me to like hide behind the counter and get them again. And really, I was outside and I threw something at the window and they just <laughs> freak. Like, what is going on out there? And then I started running back and forth outside, and they were like, well, who is that? I think one of the best, um, best horror things that, that, that can be done in a game or a movie is, like, whenever there's suspense built up. It's not necessarily a jump scare, but yeah. something like you're expecting a jump scare. Um, like, in P- the PT game, for the, what's that oh, sure. Silent Hills, 
Um, like there was like one or two jump scares in that game, but it was just creepy. Like is everything was creepy. About Very it. creepy. Um, creepy atmosphere, man. Yeah, and and that's that's what I like about horror. Like I like games that aren't just jump scares, but they're like. Well, that's that's what Silent Hill really builds on. Yeah. Is a really creepy atmosphere. Is like if it's if it has a creepy atmosphere and it makes me feel uneasy, then it's doing its job right, and that's what I consider horror. I don't really consider like a movie or a game that's just pure jump scares <laughs> horror. Sure. But, like, okay, like, you were talking about your um, girlfriend and your sister, like, about a year ago, um, one of the guys in our house watched the Babadook movie, which apparently is really scary, and so we decided that we were going to just scare the crap out of him. So we, uh, like, looked up the trailer, and there was a certain knock it did, and there was a certain noise it did, so, like, I hung over the banister, and I, like, made the knock on on the... (laughs) The banister, and he, he's like, I'm coming, and he walked to the door, and there was no one there. And he, <laughs> like, freaked out. He's like, that's so weird. And then he walked back, and then, like, ten minutes later, I did it again, and he was like, I'm coming, and he walked to the door, and there was no one there. And so, like, me playing the fool, I walked down, and I was like, hey, is, because I was supposed to be, quote, unquote, asleep, and I was like, hey, is, mm-hmm. is someone at the door? He's like, no, man, like, you don't understand, like, this is the same knock that the monster did in the movie, and then it was like, it's freaking me out, because we just watched the movie, and, like... It was doing the knock, and then there's nobody at the door. And it's like, Brandon, it's, there, there had to be someone at the door. Nobody just knocks. And, like, there's there's no... There has to be someone knocking. <laughs> and so, like, it, it, it's stuff like that. Like, when you build suspense, like, if I just jumped out and scared him, I wouldn't nearly have the pride and, and the happy memories right. that I do now. Um, sure. Yeah. It, it, again, it's that suspense. And, you know, like, me scaring them tonight, I knew they were watching a scary movie. So, like, they were already in this mm-hmm. creeped out mood. So it's like knowing what you could do to maximize that creeped out mood um, is, is awesome. Like if there had been like a unique thing like that, I would have probably made it happen because they thought I was downstairs working. <laughs> and, and that's how I kept getting them is like, nope, podcast isn't too late. <laughs> so I've got plenty of time to mess with you guys. <laughs> I think that that's... Oh. Oh, go ahead. Short circuited. That's the way we do it on the Zelda Informer <laughs> podcast. We break things. <laughs> Me. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's so, okay. That's the majority of the podcast. For those so, of you that sure. don't know, McIntyre had a problem recording his podcast. So that's that's who we're talking we're not just talking to a voice in our heads yeah randomly yeah Yeah. his computer apparently the podcast blew up his side we we, hey my computer blew up when i was editing a podcast hopefully mine doesn't (laughs) because i don't want that to happen no i would feel so bad for you if that happens (laughs) oh my gosh i'd be like well i guess i'm taking it back over first first week as the host and the editor everything blows up (laughs) oh that'd be bad okay we're about we're probably done we're we're losing our minds here all right. Matt McIntyre saying his computer blew up is uh, that must mean it's time to cut. Yep. <laughs> so, as always, uh, you can find us on Twitter and stuff. Nate, can you drop your handles and whatnot? Sure. Uh, at Nate Jantz. Obviously, I do not tweet a lot, but when I do, it's usually important. That's not true. <laughs> um, I'm usually just talking about either something going on in my life, a sports team I follow, uh, or I'm talking about Nintendo Prime and Zelda Informer, which if you guys follow Nintendo Prime or Zelda Informer, you pretty much get the gist of what's happening. Um, obviously, you can follow at Zelda Informer as well because mm-hmm. that's that's what Zelda Informer podcast. Like, we don't have our own Twitter. That is our Twitter. So, McIntyre, you tell me what you want to tell them, and I will repeat it. Nice. So he's got. You can follow him on Twitter at McIntyre Production. Produc? Produc. Produc. Yeah. Produc. Um, and then you can find him on YouTube under McIntyre Productions or just McIntyre, whatever you prefer. Um, he has a second channel that he opened up uh, for animations, and the first one he's come out with an Overwatch one. Did I get everything there? Did I forget something? Okay. Well, what's the name of your second channel? 
So Mac just Mac. Okay, McIntyre animations. That's yep. a, that's the section. I'll, I'll put all right. these all up here somewhere, and then we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll have them in the description yeah. and stuff too. So, so uh, as always, you can follow me at Full Metal Alfie on uh, Twitter, and that not I really don't have that much else. I don't really do that much online um, aside from this. So if you want to follow me and see what what kind of weird stuff I post about and how political a libertarian can be, follow me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, Thank you guys for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed um, Pumpkin Hill as the opening theme for (laughs) the podcast. All right. Happy late Halloween. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Bye.